Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fifth annual De La Salle University Undergraduate Philosophy Conference. It's really good to have all of you here with us today, and I hope you're all safe and well. Before we begin, just a gentle reminder to keep your mics on mute first. Um, if you can find your mic button on the lower left side of the app, that would be great. Uh, for the question and answer portion later, we have the raised hand function if you want to speak, and also the comment and Q&A function. So without further ado, for our welcoming remarks, let us welcome our first speaker, who is the current chairperson of the ELSU Philosophy Department, Dr. Robert James Torres. Thank you, Venice. Good day to everyone. To all philosophy faculty, distinguished guests, paper presenters and participants, and our fellow students of philosophy, Welcome to the fifth undergraduate philosophy conference of De La Salle University Manila's philosophy department. The motivation behind this event is to provide an avenue for undergraduate students to share and develop their ideas as regards the philosophical issues they are working on. Given the pandemic, we shifted to an online mode this year, and we welcome our guests and participants from the different colleges and universities across the Philippines and abroad. I would like to thank those who made this event possible, such as Dr. Fernie Santiago of DLSU's Southeast Asian Research Center and Hub, DLSU Philosopho, Philosophy Department faculty, and our distinguished guest, Dr. Jimmy Guevara, who is one of the first people who introduced me to philosophy. I hope all of us enjoy this, uh, the different sessions we have for today. Please stay safe, everyone. Thank you and best of luck and congratulations to all of our presenters. Thank you, Dr. Boyles. Uh, for, our, for our opening remarks, please welcome our next speaker who is the current vice chair of the DLSU philosophy department, Dr. Lenny Garcia. Dr. Lenny, please unmute your mic. Hello. We can hear you now. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to have you all here at the Philosophy Undergraduate Conference. Uh, it has been five years since its inauguration. And I'm very glad that despite the global crisis, we can come together to celebrate research in philosophy. Thanks to our host, um, Dr. Fernie Santiago of Search. And I'm also very happy that our move to this online platform this year has allowed me to invite a longtime friend and teacher who is actually responsible for my taking up philosophy during my undergraduate years to give the plenary lecture this year. Our guest speaker is now based in Canada, but he was also a major in philosophy here at De La Salle University. He graduated in 1981 and proceeded to take up his master's degree also in philosophy while teaching and serving as the department chair for several years before pursuing his doctorate degree at the University of Santo Tomas. His research has been concentrated on continental philosophy, especially in the existential phenomenological strand, which resonates more with his personal conviction that philosophy is always experiential and therefore personal, challenging the individual to always be true to oneself. In spite of his being away from the academe for several years now, his love for philosophy keeps him close to, 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 to true students of the discipline, as you will witness in a little while. So dear friends, honored guests, colleagues, and fellow researchers, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Jaime Guevara. Uh, Dr. Garcia, thank you so much for, for that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, Dr. R.J. Boyles, thank you so much as well. Uh, congratulations on being a chairman. And, uh, and Denise, thank you so much for, the, uh, for coordinating everything else. Can you hear me, you guys? Yes, Dr. Guevara, we can hear you. Okay, so the uh, title of my informal talk is on presence and the state of detached awareness. So... Let's begin with this. Uh, there was a time when the um, internet did not exist. 
I know how hard it is for uh, many of you to imagine what life is like without it. Uh, my wife once asked my daughter, did you know that there was no internet during our time? Wow, my daughter said, it must have been really boring. Surprisingly, my wife agreed. And like fish taken to water, she said how joyful it was to spend time with family and friends on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and uh, noticeably, she never mentioned me at one, not once at all. Uh, technology is a wonderful thing for as long as it contributes to living a meaningful life. Use it, but don't be used by it. Unfortunately, people forget that. A friend of mine, realizing that she had left her phone at home, begged her boss to give her 30 minutes to be reunited with her phone. An hour later, she arrived in the office with relief written across her face. Now, people I know check their social media first thing in the morning. They seem so comical when they notice that their phones are not where they're supposed to be. I get it, but shouldn't they be more worried about the consequences of forgetting who they are? Now, those who are into reading philosophy books are not immune to forgetfulness either. So attached are they to their favorite philosophy that they are offended when their philosophy hero is under heavy scrutiny. But <clears throat> this to me show, reveals, this reaction reveals that they have forgotten why they philosophized in the first place. Now, as far as I'm concerned, philosophy will never go out of style because in your desire to be truthful to yourself, you try to recall what you have forgotten. Be thankful to the ever-changing historical events for they force you to question your beliefs that outgrew their use. That is why every age asks these questions again. Questions like, is there truth? Does, does it mean that there is no truth? The truth that we speak of. This question must be asked so you can see that it misses the whole point of philosophizing. If you're looking for truths as you would find them in the sciences or in religions, you will be disappointed and become disillusioned with philosophy. But if you know what to look for in philosophy, you will see that philosophy is the freest of all activities. With this freedom, you will find your grounding. I doubt that you and I or anyone else will ever find the truth. However, you will have at least learned never to forget to examine yourself. This is the consolation of philosophy. So let me tell you this. <clears throat> Philosophizing, unlike other disciplines, requires you to stay still and silent. Silence lets loose of the hold that ideas and biases and prejudices have on you. To get a better grip of what it is like to be in a state of silence, let us begin by examining the simplest form of awareness. When you are aware of what you are doing, you, you step back. You are aware that you are walking. This is awareness in its simplest form. Now, now, before you became aware that you were walking, that was just walking, <clears throat> a consciousness of walking. In other words, as the self the, or the grammatical I, you are absent, absent most of the time. It is impossible to be aware of everything that you do, feel, and, and think. But when you do step back, you become aware of something, either because something does not feel right, or you realize that the things that you had taken for granted had been taken away from you, or you were struck by the extraordinary in the ordinary. Only then do questions begin to surface. Now take, for example, the lockdown situation. Businesses shut down, prompting their employees to work from home. Same with schools that have means to go online. Those hit the hardest go hungry and struggle to find means of keeping their families alive. What was once taken for granted cannot and should not, no longer be taken for granted. Economic security is an illusion. Even during the pre-COVID days, businesses must continually find ways to increase profit. When sales are down, thought leaders step back, and recognize the need to find newer and different approaches to sales and marketing. Current approaches outlive their usefulness and must therefore be replaced with something entirely new. As history has it, Isaac Newton, one of the greatest scientific minds, was sitting under an apple tree when suddenly an apple fell on his head. Well, um, 
had it fallen on my head, I would have picked it up, eaten it, and that would be the end of the story about me and the apple. But not for Newton. The story continues for him. He was struck by the extraordinary in the ordinary. He was floored by the way the apple behaved. It fell. It did not suspend in midair. It did not fly away. Why? Newton asked, what pulled the apple towards the earth? Why does matter behave in such a way? So let us pause for a moment and take note of certain features about being aware. When you are aware, you are within a field. A field has well-defined contours that distinguish itself from other fields. You have a corn field, you have a papaya field, a banana field. Similarly, you have a field of sales, a field of marketing, fields of chemistry, physics, biology, etc. Now, some fields may overlap on one another, such as social psychology, which focus on the behavior of humans as social beings. When you are aware, you are focused on something. Being focused, you make certain assumptions. For instance, physicists make certain assumptions about reality so they can focus their attention only on matter and energy that can be translated into the language of mathematics. Now, guided by the assumptions they make about reality, scientists formulate questions that have nothing to do with spirits and ghosts. Now, even the simplest kinds of questions share this, these features. For example, when you're confronted with something new like smartphones for the, for the first time, you would naturally ask, what is that? What is it for? Unknowingly, you assume that the thing in question exists, it is real, that it must have a purpose, and that an intelligent human being had designed it. Limits, not limitation, but limits is another feature of awareness. Let's talk about basketball. There are limits. Rules are the limits. Limits, limits determine how the game is to be played, won, and lost. Now, these limits are not limitations. For example, why? Because Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, or LeBron James, or even Kawhi Leonard are prime examples of creativity. Chess is another example. Only 64 squares on the board. Each piece moves in a certain way. Yet these limits do not stop Wesley So, uh, the greatest chess mind the, the Philippines has ever produced, okay? So these limits do not stop Wesley So from creating moves of chess poetry. So you see, without these limits, there would be no freedom to create. Without these limits, we would still be living in caves. Let us label this awareness, attached awareness. Attached awareness works within a field, so it can focus on something. Attached awareness makes assumptions without which you would not even be able to ask specific questions. And attached awareness has limits that enable you to search and gain knowledge. In other words, attached awareness is restricted to these conditions. Because of these conditions, you, like the physicist, already know what aspect of reality to look at, what to look for, not, specific, not specifically, but generally, and what to focus on. Now, interestingly, Immanuel Kant thinks in similar lines. He claims that reality as it is, or the noumenon, lies beyond the human mind. You and I know reality only as it appears to us. This means that the appearance of reality is determined by how the human mind is programmed to understand. This further goes to show that what we know about reality is just an interpretation of the thing in itself. <clears throat> in other words, when you interpret a thing or events, you organize them. By organizing them, you disfigure them. And in doing so, you reconfigure in order to understand them on your own terms. Numinon, or reality as it is, is disfigured then reconfigured so you can understand. So fields and focusing disfigure in order to reconfigure for human intellectual consumption. Perhaps that is a bit abstract. So let me give you an example of what we do to a pig. We disfigure the pig, then we reconfigure it into longanisa, then it's ready for human consumption. 
As you are engaged in disfiguring and reconfiguring, you act aggressively towards that which you are attempting to understand. It's what we do in the state of attached awareness. Now, this is not about whether it is morally good or bad, uh, morally or good or bad thing to do or what we're doing. Rather, it is a necessary process if you and I hope to acquire knowledge at all. Attached awareness, therefore, is interpretive understanding. So by, underst by interpreting a thing or events, you disfigure, then reconfigure, so you can know something about them. <clears throat> Let's tie this up to our previous examples. When Isaac Newton pondered over the behavior of the apple, he disregarded many non-quantitative and non-logical things so he can focus only on what is quantitative to force, to force it to speak the language of mathematics. Salespeople are also engaged in this process of interpretive understanding. To increase profit, salespeople focus on the measurable behavior of the consumer and turn the information into statistical data to be analyzed. Everything else has been left out that does not contribute to increasing revenue. <clears throat> Now let us step back a bit further. We were talking about the aggressive act of attached awareness towards reality. But, and let me ask you some questions here. Isn't there a way to prevent this from happening? Can we stop this aggressive behavior towards reality? If we are able to stop that, does it mean that we have to let go of focus, fields, interpretation, disfiguring and reconfiguring? and even questioning? If we let go of these conditions, can we expect to know at all? What is awareness left with if it is detached from these conditions? Will there even be awareness at all? At this very moment, realize that we are engaged in conceptualization. We are thinking about these ideas rather than feeding them. When I ask those questions, you will have conceptually arrived at the idea that without attached awareness, there's nothing to know about anything. Now, conceptually, you are correct. Kant agrees with you that reality is known conceptually. But who said that reality cannot be reached by means other than conceptualization? Why confine ourselves to conceptualization? Why confine ourselves to the structures of the human mind as Kant would have it? I hesitate to use the word experience because it might confuse you with another word that I will be using throughout this informal talk. The word experience, as you were taught in academic philosophy, is said to be limited to the five senses. So in place of experience, let us use, let us use the word encounter. In encountering, something happens to you. This is in direct opposition to what attached awareness does to a thing. When you encounter something that happens to you, the conditions of attached awareness, namely field, focus, configuring, disfiguring, all lose their relevance. In other words, when something happens to you, you have no time to disfigure, no time to reconfigure it. As you may have noticed, I use the word something and the other word it to refer to you to that which happens to you. Yet that which happens to you is not a thing not even an idea or an image. The word thing implies that you are talking about a particular entity located in space. Same thing goes for thinking about a certain idea, that is this, this idea and not the other idea. So let us replace the word something with the word presence. Let us use presence and encountering in a sentence. When you encounter a presence, you do so without direct reference to any particular thing in time and space. Presence happens to you. Presence does something to you. Um, please forgive those mystically inclined thinkers who try their best to explain what they encounter by using a language that points to a specific thing or specific idea. What they encounter, namely presence, is in no way like, like experiencing a specific thing or a specific idea. Perhaps they are finding it difficult to convey their ideas because they use prose, like what I'm currently doing. 
when they should be using poetry or stories or parables that might be suited best at hinting at the presence. So what then is presence that we encounter as the conditions of attached awareness no longer have a hold on you? Let us be clear, presence is not knowledge. It is not a concept, not an idea, not even an image. All right, so you had noticed the tables, spoons, birds flying over you and perching on the fences, dogs, cats, bees, flies, people walking by, images of people on YouTube, noises in the background. In other words, you experience specific objects that are defined by their color, shape, and size, the time, and the place they occupy in space, and the distance between them and yourself. You take for granted that they exist. Now, all of a sudden, in a state of silence that you involuntarily and unexpectedly fall into, when assumptions melting away have no hold over you, the awareness is no longer on any of these things, yet awareness concerns itself with all of them. What you encountered is the very presence of things, the presence which belongs to all that exists. That is the presence of existence. You did not make it happen. You did not choose to encounter presence. It happened to you. In encountering presence, you are compelled to ask the most fundamental of all philosophical questions, namely, why is there existence rather than nothing? Why is there being rather than nothing? Take note that philosophizing begins not with a question, but with an encounter of presence from which you proceed to formulate philosophical questions. Presence is that which is being received when you are in a state of detached awareness a state in which you are silent, an empty cup, as the Zen Buddhist would say. Silence heightens your ability to receive presence on its own terms. The very opposite of what Kant was saying. What you receive depends on what you were focusing on that time, birds, bees, flies. If you were focusing on beautiful things, then in a state of silence, of heightened receptivity, you are struck by the presence of beauty of it all not this or that beautiful thing. From there, awed by the presence, you wander about it and formulate a question such as, what is beauty? This same procedure applies to the presence of justice, morality, love, to name a few. In history, there are various ways of expressing presence. Presence is often associated with the word God. Okay, so let me repeat that. Presence is often associated with the word God. Though tempting to call it God, it really is just a presence. Here are a few expressions. Benedict Spinoza views God as a substance which by definition is not dependent on anything for it to exist. It logically follows that for God or sometimes called nature to be an independent substance, God must be composed of an infinite number of attributes. Now, we only know two of them thought and extension. <clears throat> we understand and feel because we are composed of mind and body, which are respectively modes of thought and extension. We know God partially because we partake in God's attributes, but God is more than these attributes for God is composed of an infinite number of attributes. Now we don't know what it's like to be an infinite being, but that does not stop us from understanding the concept of infinity. You and I cannot possibly imagine, for example, an infinitely long line, a line that never ends, yet we understand the concept of infinity. Because God has an infinite number of attributes, God is not a concept, nor is God to be reduced to a concept or image. Spinoza's way of speaking of God leads me to suspect that he uses logic to express his encounter with a presence that is beyond human understanding. You see, Spinoza, in my mind, is a closet mystic. Now, going back more than 100 years ago before Spinoza's time, Saint Anselm made a similar attempt. As you know, Saint Anselm described God as, and I quote, a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. I repeat that. He described, um, Saint he described God as a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. 
Again, Saint Anselm is describing a presence and is using logic to explain that which cannot be grasped by logic. Here, God cannot be thought because God is not a thought. Yet with some effort, we can understand conceptually what it would take for a being to be a God, namely a being than which nothing greater can be thought. In the last century, <clears throat> Paul Tillich, a theologian and a philosopher proclaims that God, not as a being, but as the ground of being. God is or was not in a particular place like Jerusalem or Mount Sinai. Neither was God there in time 5,000 years ago. Any reference to a place or time applies only to beings. Therefore, God is the ground on which and for which all beings exist. Now, Isaac Newton too had his philosophical moment of encountering presence when he became fully aware that he is but a tiny pebble among the many pebbles in the seashore. Now, as I have said earlier, prose is a difficult way to explain presence. So let's try poetry. Here are a few lines from Dao De Jing. It reads, the way that can be walked is not the eternal way. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth. The named is the mother of all things. Therefore, free from desire, you see the mystery. Free, full of desire, you see the manifestations. These two have the same origin, but differ in name. That is the secret, the secret of all secrets, the gate to all mysteries. In closing, let me list a few things that can be learned from encountering presence in silence. Encountering a presence does not produce knowledge. It simply makes you fully aware of presence and through it yourself. It also makes you fully aware that these ideas you learn from philosophers or even from your own attempts at, are, mere, are mere manifestations. For that, I advise you to not cling to any of them. Use them as you should but don't ever be used. The ideas you have or will have learned are important for they are attempts to get to the bottom of things. Yet these ideas are fleeting. Now, this is why it is important to revisit ideas, theirs and yours. Read Plato after many years and I guarantee you that you will find something different from when you first read, read his works. Encountering presence teaches you to acknowledge that no one idea can claim to know the truth. And that includes yours as well as mine. That is why dialogue or a conversation among friends and books is so important and enlightening. Finally, encountering presence leaves you with a renewed sense of purpose that you still have yet to conceptually understand. Whatever is the purpose, it is important if you are to stay focused and remember presence to ask your own questions and to stay faithful to your own experience. Do not let anyone tell you what you should be thinking about. Thank you. And that ends my talk. Where to go from here? <laughs> uh, thank you, <laughs> Dr. Guevara. Yeah. Um, oh, there. Thank you, Dr. Guevara. Um, that was. That was really inspirational. <laughs> yeah, God, I, I miss philosophy. Okay, uh, we are now <laughs> opening the floor for our questions. So again, just a reminder, kindly use the raise hand function if you want to speak and wait for me to acknowledge you. Or alternatively, you may use the comment or the Q&A function. So time check, it is now 9.39. So we're really early. Um, perhaps we can allot like the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes for any questions or comments. So the floor is now open for questions. I think they're being silent. Does any 
bridge. Um, uh, there's a question here um, by Blessed Isaac Conde. Would you agree with Aquinas' the description of God, or do you think he limits God? Well, um, again, in my opinion, in my reading his Summa Theologia, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, again, just like St. Anselm and, his, and the rest of his colleagues, past and, uh, and, and his contemporaries, um, you know, when they, they actually, to my, in my opinion, they always, they always start as a, as a mystic. You know, they always have this religious experience. As a matter of fact, St. Thomas Aquinas once said that, uh, you know, in, in his deathbed, that what he has learned about, um, about uh, God through philosophy is, is really nothing so much. Uh, he did admonish us that even though, you know, we are defining God, what we know about God is, is so little. There's no way to understand what God he is as himself. Uh, and let me also um, add there as well, St. Augustine who, who preceded St. Thomas Aquinas uh, also said that, to, you know, even if we cannot talk about God the way we talk about things, and, but because he is the object of our, uh, the object of our ultimate desire, um, you know, even though we can't talk about God, we still have to talk about him, you know? Um, the, <clears throat> so in regards to my paper, I, I did say to you, I did, I did mention to you very, very clearly that uh, a lot of philosophers in, in the past have associated that experience of presence with the word God. And um, um, the thing is, personally, I can't even, I cannot even call it God because the word God is full of uh, anthropomorphic uh, connotations. You know, the white guy with the guy with a white beard on, in, in heaven, uh, the, the person who is not responsible for the evil on, on earth and so forth. And this was a, this was an existential struggle for me as, as, a, as a human being um, who was brought up as a, as a Catholic. So I have decided that, you know, with all of these, you know, and thank, thankfully with, with you know, with the help of Kant, who gave me a, a, a way by saying that there's really no way to know God because, you know, we're just stuck, we're stuck with, we're, well, from his perspective, we're stuck with, uh, to only understand reality from our human structure. This gives me the understanding, therefore, that whatever we say about God is, is, um, is um, always, will always fall short of God. So the best thing that I could, the best thing I could say is, um, you know, you just experience presence. And if you want to call it God, that's up to you. But um, yeah. So is, so going back to your question, does it limit, does the St. Thomas Aquinas uh, definition of God limit him, limit God? Uh, yes, but he also placed place a disclaimer there by saying that, you know, our notion, our notion of God is not in any way uh, completely conform to what God really is. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Guevara. So we have another um, question from the audience. Yeah, also I think it's Enrique. For, yes, oh. for Mr. Enrique Miguel Ramos. Yeah. Uh, Good hello. Morning. Good morning, Enrique. How are you? Good morning. Uh, I'm all right, considering the situation. I just wanted to ask, because you mentioned actually in, in comes to being a philosopher or having philosophical thought that silence is important. But then you also mentioned, if for reflection, silence is important. But you also mentioned that discussions and uh, uh, like, I think that's actually close to what Socrates did, wherein he kept talking to others and challenging their thought and kept opening their minds or at least tried to in so many ways, uh, which do you think is more important and being able to be a, like, not a successful philosopher, just mm -hmm. in being in philosophical thought in itself, which do you think is more important? Uh, the silence or the conversation? Oh, that's, that's a very good question. I'm glad that you brought that up because I, um, I kind of anticipated that one of you guys are gonna be asking me that question. So thanks, thanks very much Enrique for that, for that uh, opportunity. I would say both of them are very important, right? I mean, they, they actually complement each other. However, uh, 
So let's start off with the, the Socratic method or the conversation or the dialogue. This is very important because it not only challenges you, but it also makes you aware of your own assumptions, your own biases and prejudices, right? Being humans, being a, a historical being, uh, we, we cannot but have prejudices and, and, and biases. Uh, biases, I mean, you know, due to the fact that you are, you are born in the 20th century and not in the 19th century. So, so therefore the notion of truth or the notion of freedom would have different connotations for, for, both, for, for both you and the person in the 19th century or the 20th century for that matter. Um, however, in my own experience, um, in my own experience of presence, and I think, I think I'm not the only one who does that. I think a lot of people who have, find, who have found time to, to be alone with his thoughts or to be alone, you know, become silent, then suddenly they have this, um, using a religious term, which is not really to mean religious at all, a revelation of presence, um, should give you this feeling that there is something beyond yourself, right? But it cannot be conceptualized. So, but on the other hand, you cannot keep quiet about it as well. You can't, you can't just say, okay, I have this presence and therefore, what do I do next? You cannot but talk, try to figure out what it was. So in comes the conversation, in, in comes um, a dialogue with friends um, who may have similar experience. Obviously, you know, it's got to be difficult and possibly a waste of time to have a conversation with somebody who, who has no inkling of what you're talking about. So when I say conversation or a dialogue with friends, I mean people who are not necessarily personally your friends, but friends who are, who, are, who are in the same situation that you are in, you want to know the truth and you, and you are also, and each, each one of you is aware, uh, are aware of um, your own biases and so forth. And conversation helps you in, in trying to clarify whatever you were questioning or, and whatever you, 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 you uh, encounter as presence. So, for example, I told you, depending on what you were focusing on, let us say the existence of things, your question would be, why is there being at all? Why is there, why is there something rather than nothing? Then you want, so at that time, you don't know what it is. You, you can't answer it. And that's why you have questions after you press, you have that the encounter of presence. You then look for people to be in conversation who have the same experience and discuss it. Now, the good, nice thing about philosophy, and uh, at least the way at least, at least I see it philosophy, there's, there's nothing determined. So philosophers are, gen, are, 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 are journeymen. They, they are, they're always traveling, looking for, for um, ideas. And I'm 61 and I haven't really, I, and I can tell you very clearly now that, um, and, and convincingly, at least as far as I'm concerned, I haven't found truth, but I did find little truths on the way by having conversations with people who think the same way I do or differently, but thinking about the same topic. So yeah, be joyful in the sense that there's nothing, deter in my opinion, there's nothing determined. Um, it's, the, it's the joy, it's the ride and, and finding truths along the way that, that makes uh, philosophy not only relevant, but you know something personal. Now, provided Enrique, that when you you know when you ask questions, and when you try to find your own answers, you are grounded in presence. Now, why do I say that? Because some people, like the skeptics uh, back in, so in in the time of Socrates and Plato, they just ask questions for the heck of it, but they're not grounded in in, in anything. So they ask questions for the heck of it. There'll, there'll come a time when you know, if a skeptic is, um, is um, truthful to himself, he would say, why am I questioning when I don't even know why I'm questioning? So you question because you, you, you experience something that, is, um, that, is, that cannot be conceptualized, but you do have an experience of, or the encounter of presence. Um, Enrique, so I think they go together, but the one that would be leading the other should first be presence to give you a purpose of asking questions and, and conversing with other, with other uh, friends.
and by friends, I mean those who are um, in the same agreement as you are, wanting to know more about the world, about yourself, and so forth. Okay, Enrique, thanks very much for that opportunity to, to answer that question. Thank you, sir. Uh, is it all right to ask another question, or do I have no, I don't to mind raise at all. my hand again? Okay, <laughs> just to clarify uh, with the system in place, I don't want to just suddenly, you know, not give the oh. other people an opportunity to ask. Sure. But I do want to ask this because it's always it's always something like when you mentioned presence, like when you you know when you're uh, reflecting and you're thinking on yourself and grounding yourself. I understand that like a philosophy in general is quite difficult for. I don't want to sound, I fear that it sounds condescending when I say it that way, but it is undoubtedly considered difficult for most people. Yeah. Like swallowing that pill and accepting that, you know, there's so many things that you can't really know. And, but then I always find the, when you, when you reflect, when you self reflect, and the weight of knowing that you are such a minor, thought mm -hmm. in such a massive field of so many other people so many other things in this massive universe even and i can understand that philosophy is terrifying <laughs> it, yeah. it, it, in, a, in a sense right i because agree like, i agree I yeah agree. like mm. when you when you were self-reflecting i've actually reached that point where i'm self-reflecting and i reach that point where i realize that i'm such a minor like unimportant speck in mm -hmm. such a massive scale that I can't even comprehend. And mm -hmm. it terrifies me. And my question is simply, not just for me, but for others who might be interested in philosophy or others who are actually already terrified of philosophy, what do you do with that terror? Like, do you accept it? Do you deny it? How do you, what, how do you handle that sort of like terror on such a huge okay. level? Okay, great. Uh, that's that's another ex very nice, ex uh, very nice question, Enrique. I really enjoy that. Um, honestly, now take note that when when you're, you're when you're terrified, you know, uh, so you're you're terrified. You're afraid of the fact that you're just uh, like what um, what's his name um, Isaac Newton said. He's just a tiny pebble among many pe many pebbles, and you're just a speck, right? Well, take note that when you are terrified, your mind is noisy right? It's noisy. You, you have a lot of thoughts going on. And, and, and I, I know this because I've experienced this myself. So when I was uh, probably your age, um, when you're terrified, you're not in a state of detached awareness. You're not, you are in a state of, well, let's call it noisy. You, you have many thoughts and there are so many voices telling you this and that, right? So how do you, and the tendency therefore is like, like um, like somebody who's so afraid of reality, you know, they cling on to something that they can hold on to, uh, like their image of God, right? But that makes things worse. So presence, okay, when you encounter presence, you are in a you are in a state of silence. When you're in a state of silence, there's no more noise, right? And when there's no more noise, you are you have to you have to accept the fact that. When you are in the presence of silence, in the presence of, you know, uh, in, in the presence of presence, put it that way, when your mind is silent and you're receptive, your body, if you were to realize, is also calmed down. So out of that experience that I have of presence, um, and this takes time for us, take, took time for me to understand, you, you, you would rather not go away from it, rather, you would rather not react negatively towards it, but you would rather embrace it. And this is one of the things that I've um, understood by encounter presence. You embrace it, you take it as it is, you embrace it. And then from there, you know, prioritize. Should I, should I listen to what others have said that frightened me? Should I, where, where is this thought that, that frightened me? Okay, so only when you are in a silent mood that you will be able to calmly and embracingly understand how to deal with these, uh, these thoughts that should not terrify you, but terrified you. So there's a difference. Thoughts of these thoughts 
are not terrifying. It's because of how you react to these thoughts that you thought the thoughts are terrifying you when in fact you're just terrified or terrifying yourself. So the best solution there, Enrique, is, you know, um, calm down, be, be in a site, you know, find the conditions by which you become vulnerable, when you become receptive and open to the presence. And from there, and it takes time to understand this later on, and that's the, that, and that's the beauty of philosophy. Nothing is, nothing is uh, tailored, nothing is uh, determined. You eventually understand that, oh yes, I will need to calm down and embrace, embrace it. Now, um, imagine, so think of, think of these fleeting thoughts as, as, uh, as a typhoon, right? And in a typhoon, there's a lot of things that are flying all, all over the place. So these thoughts are flying all, all over the place and they're, they're going crazy because of the, of, the, of the weather conditions. So how do you deal with that if you're in a typhoon? Well, you can either panic or you know, calm down and take things as they are and see how to solve it. And for me, the Archimedes point, meaning the, the point that doesn't move, is presence. It's, it's presence that gives me this calmness when I'm dealing with, um, you know, these fleeting, sometimes dangerous looking thoughts that can terrify you. Well, when you are in the, when you are in that state of silence or detached awareness, then there is, there is no, uh, you know, there is no more panic. And then from there, reflect on that. And then you'll understand how to deal with other priorities. Okay, Enrique. Um, thank you for that. Thank you, sir. sir uh, uh, Enrique, yes. Enrique, one last thing. Um, I'm glad that you brought oh, yes. it up. You know, you should start. Re you should start reading. Um, who's that guy? Uh, Watts. Uh, read Zen. Okay. Read Zen. Zen. It's Zen. Well, basically, Zen Buddhism. Um, um, read Zen Buddhism. It's not. It's not a school of thought. It's a way of life which you can complement with whatever you choose to be your school of thought. Maybe it's analytic, analytical, or existential, or uh, or whatnot. Uh, it's it's not a school of thought. It's not a religion. It's just a way of life, and it can calm you down. Um, and then you know you can deal with the the torrid seas. Of thought. Uh, just try it. See what happens. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you so You're much. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Guevara. Um, mm. Before we move on to the questions in the Q&A section. Uh, Alan Watts. A... Sorry, that's right, Josh. Thank you so much. Alan Watts. Sorry about that, Benice. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Lenny Garcia in the chat. Oh, yeah, yeah. I see it. Okay. Let me read it out. Um, or should you read it out? Okay, I can read it out. Okay, uh, okay. Dr. Guevara, if presence is to be encountered more properly with silence, and if philosophy is about our encounter with presence, should the manner of doing philosophy then be transformed in order to be more open to this presence? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, I... Sorry, uh, just to clarify, because you already mentioned Zen, I was, gonna, I was going to say after this that uh, the reason for the question is that your 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 thoughts very uh, much sounded like Zen, and um, Zen has always been looked upon as something anti-philosophical. Not because it is not philosophical. Yeah, I know. I know. Because of the manner it's always critical of the manner, especially the adversarial argumentation that we promote and we, you know, that that, that people identify Western philosophy with. Yeah. Right. I agree. Well, Dr. Garcia, you, I'm pretty sure you, you, you and I agree that, you know, when, when somebody accuses uh, Zen as being anti-philosophical, anti well, you know, we have to ask, what is philosophy? Or from whose perspective is, uh, do you call philosophy a philosophy? And uh, like it or not, we, <clears throat> you and I and everybody else have, have been um, uh, attuned to the Western marketing of philosophy, if you want to call it that way. But it's a good thing that um, uh, 
some of us have were able to escape that, you know, and 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 realize that philosophy is well, it's it's simply the desire to know. It, it desire, I don't know. I, I might sound like I might sound platonic here, um, without trying to be play, uh, a platonic philosopher. But there's the tendency of going going back to to your roots, which is to me uh, uh, mystical, right? And 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 this is prodded by being in a silent mode, so to speak. And this is where, and then from there. Now, here's here's what I think. I, I found to be interesting. Uh, Zen, in my own reading of Zen and, and Tao Te Ching, which are very related with each other, um, <clears throat> the the encounter of the the encounter of presence, whatever you want to call it, the kind of presence, and this is what strike struck me most, because I found out that the, the the encounter of presence is has to be where you are vulnerable when you're opened. When you're receptive, when you're silent, all these mean all the same thing. But there's no knowledge at all. There's no concept. There's no image. It's just a presence. And and sorry if um, I can't make sense out of that through uh, uh, to those who are you know in the mode of analytical philosopher. But I would say I would have to say don't look at my finger. Look at what I'm pointing at. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, <clears throat> So that's that's what I mean by yes. Um, we we you and I can't force anybody to think the way we think, but uh, and maybe that's the beauty of diversity in philosophy. Yes. Um, but but if if I if you and I did find some grounding, um, not in a not in an idea or an image or a concept, but in a grounding that even embraces uh, the ever changing reality, then. Yeah, I would, I would encourage people to, you know, to be silent, you know, and after which, you know, converse with friends and books uh, in a dialogical uh, relationship. That's how I see it. Yeah, yeah uh, just to um, make sure that everybody knows, I have no problem with, with Zen being thought of as anti-philosophical. You know? Yeah, me too, me too. I like, I like it that there's a critique of the manner of philosophizing, and it just... Um, like if I may, you know, I, I just find it interesting because Heidegger himself went into that mode later on in his life. And I think he's yeah. also being critiqued because, you know, he got into poetry and he's talking about, <laughs> right? And, um, yeah, that's true, that's I, true. and I think that's what he was trying to say and you've articulated it very well, you know, in, in, in a very, in, in a simpler non-Heideggerian way. Um, he was trying to capture presence uh, of mm. being but he, he, he does realize, uh, oh, by the way, you know that he translated the Tao Te Ching as well, and he got it. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, okay. yes, yes, he was collaborating with a Chinese philosopher, translating it. Uh, I don't think they finished it, but oh. he became so, you know how philosophers are, right? They, he became so obsessed with, with, the, with Tao and thought that it should be the, the, the guiding word, the light word. Um, which for him is vague. Of course, you know, a lot of uh, scholarship has been done on this, you know, is Da really the Heideggerian vague? But um, I just want to emphasize that, um, I don't know, maybe it comes with age. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Heidegger became some sort of a mystic and people, you know, were kind of critiquing his, his, um, his, his promotion of silence uh, or at right. least poetry, uh, poesia. Right, in mm. order to disclose being. But thank you very much. You know, yeah. I love it. Thank you. I, I, I totally agree with, I, well, here I go again. I totally agree with you. Um, but I also would like to um, uh, uh, direct our, our attention back to what Enrique said, and because it prompted me to say something very personal. Uh, so, Enrique, if you're listening and the others who are listening, yes, I have gone through a lot of um, existential angst. Um, uh, not just in life, uh, you know, but also because of philosophy. So philosophy was a curse as well as a gift. And, and unlike, and I, you know, and, and unlike Descartes, who, who I feel was uh, not authentic when he, when he felt so relieved that he found God through himself, the, uh, inauthentic I. 
I, I, um, I wanted to find a way by which I could, um, you know, embrace the diversity and sometimes the relativity of ideas and some conflicting ideas. I mean, in other words, how could I live? How could I be grounded in spite and because of these things, right? <clears throat> um, I am, uh, the, the good thing about post-modernity is that it opens up, it gives voice to the voices that have been, that have been silent and uh, silenced and that have been oppressed. But I disagree with postmodernism when they say that there's uh, there is no grounding or there's no truth. Now I'm not saying there is the truth, but there is grounding, and this is what gives me some kind of uh, clarity um, in in encountering the presence, and this gives me calmness, not because not in spite of, but because of the diversity and the conflicting ideas. That I had gone through myself as a as a uh, uh, when I was in in college. So yeah, it's it's still a struggle, uh, Enrique, and the rest. It's still a struggling, but I'm struggling them calmly. You know, um, it, there is still some. Um, I'm not any more ang anxious. Um, I don't have you know. I I have. I think I have made my peace with the presence by not calling it God. I mean, there was a time when I said, okay, God, I don't, I, I can't believe you the way I was taught to, to believe you. What else is there to believe in you if God is named that way by my parents and by, by my tradition and so forth? I can't live with that thought. Uh, the thought that, um, you know, you are omnipotent, omnipresent uh, and all that's all, and all good. And yet you allow 6 million Jews to die. Okay, and it, it just I just can't I just can't seem to stomach that. So I had to let go of, of all the anthropomorphic um, imagery of God or goddesses, he or it or she, and go back to being going going again through silence. You actually go back to yourself to be able to be open to the presence that you encounter. And that's where you said that, and that's where I finally came out several years later. Like, hey, um, if God is not a thought, then God cannot be, you know, the way we were taught. But there is a there is a presence that I'm very calm with. Yeah. So um, that that's how I dealt with my existential anxiety. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from yeah. Joseph Martin Jose. Um, okay, he where's... says here in the Q and A, sir. Oh, uh, he okay. says here, "Hi, sir. If consciousness has the essential feature of intentionality, or always being directed towards something, is silence of consciousness really possible, given that it always thinks, feels, etc., about something?" Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, in in my paper, um, consciousness. From, from the Husserlian, Husserlian perspective is always intending towards something. That's why consciousness is consciousness of something. And I had that in mind when I wrote that paper, <clears throat> but I wanted to elaborate that by talking about uh, um, you know, the, the fields, the focusing, uh, the configuring, the reconfiguring. So I, I, I tried my best to um, elaborate what it means for consciousness to be conscious of something. Now. Having said that, I also realized that the consciousness of consciousness of something, which I call attached awareness, uh, um, is not the only way that we can be aware of things. So that's why I was questioning in the latter part of the paper, is it possible that we can let go of these intentionalities? You know, um, can we let go of intentionality vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, disfiguring, configuring, focusing um, assumptions and all that? Now, mark my word that after experiencing or encountering the presence, we descend. We descend to the valley of attached awareness. Um, so because we are a historical being, because we are human beings with limitations, um, we cannot but 
be again prejudiced and biased. But this time, you become more aware of your prejudice and bias. This time you become more aware of that because you have encountered the presence. And this is why I was telling Enrique that the presence should be the grounding. You know, uh, the lessons that we, we, we have learned, that I have learned from encountering presence is, yeah, knowing that you have, that no, no, no one school of thought has the monopoly of truth or can say everything about the truth, about reality. That even you yourself can't say anything about the truth. Um, you don't have the monop monopoly. This is why it is necessary to have a conversation. But yet, your conversation, your 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 thinking now is kind of is kind of grounded on presence. And again, I go back to that proverbial: "Don't look at my pointing finger. Look at what my finger is pointing at." Um, because. The encounter of present is not a is not a concept. It's not an idea. It's not an image. You know, um, for the lack of a better word, it, experience it yourself before I say anything. Um, it's very similar to trying to explain to somebody who has never never eaten an apple before. He's eaten other fruits, and if I try to explain to him what an apple is, he would always refer back to, "Oh, okay, I ate an I, I ate orange." but that's not orange. I ate papaya, but that's not papaya. I ate a uh, banana, but this apple that I'm, I, I am big, I'm, that he's telling me is not an apple. It's, it's, it's not exactly a banana. So what's the best thing to do? Well, go to the shop or go to the uh, grocery and buy an apple. Same thing here, okay? Don't look at my finger pointing finger, but look at the thing that's being pointed at. So um, how do you experience the present encounter? Uh, how do you encounter the presence? First of all, it's involuntary, okay? And it's always, always unexpected. So you can't anticipate that. You can't go back to your room, uh, thanks to COVID, uh, lock yourself up and then say, okay, I'm ready now to experience it because I'm silent. Well, the mere fact that you're talking, you're not silent, okay? Thanks very much for that um, question. I'm Joseph Martin, I believe. Sorry. Yes, Joseph Martin Hassan. Thank you. So Thank you so much. much. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> after that, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. So, what mm. are your thoughts on the conception of God as a relation, not as nature or as transcendental entity, but as something inherently social? So, to love another is to see the face of God. Uh, could you repeat the, the, last, the last question? Uh, what are your thoughts on the conception of God as a relation, not as nature or as transcendental entity, but as something inherently social? To love another is to see the face of God. Okay, good question. Um, <clears throat> as, I, as I was hinting at <clears throat> in my paper, that uh, philosophers who talk of, who, who encounter the presence, encounter presence would, would, would because of their history, historical, because of the historical context, uh, would associate, associate the encounter of presence with the word God. And the problem with the word God is, uh, again, uh, the, the problem with the word God, and I don't like to use the word God, uh, is because of the anthropomorphic connotations. Um, going back to Meister Eckhart, who is a Christian mystic. I don't know why. Well, anyway, he's, he's a Christian mystic who doesn't mention God at all, but rather he mentions the Godhood of God. Again, unspeakable, uh, unspeakable presence, okay? So if you're talking about uh, that, then I, I really don't know what to say. Honest, uh, honest to God, <laughs> figure of speech. Uh, I really don't know what to say except this, that if, if, if your encounter with the presence um, leads you to seeing everything to be in relation, I'm all for it because, you know, we're, we're not Cartesian. By all means, we're not Cartesian. Um, we, are not a, we are not an isolated ego among other egos. I think there is always a relationship. Now, if you want to see God, 
however you want to see God, in relation as a transcendental, by all means, go ahead and, and, and explore, explore that idea, uh, provided, provided that, um, you know, your notion of God would not lead to justification of violence. So I, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I'm, I, I, always, I always think that whoever uses the word God, I'm okay with it for as long as, as you don't use God um, in a way that would justify you know, uh, your bias or justify your, the act of violence. That's how I see it. So God to me is, um, yeah, I can talk to, I can talk to my mother about, I mean, I can listen to my mother about God, but then I'll, I'll, I'll just listen. I won't say anything. <laughs> so G-O-D for me is, um, uh, it's just too much. There's just too much anthropomorphic connotation that that I, I just have to say this. I, I don't think uh, God should ever be seen as from the human perspective. And that if that's the case, then yeah, I have to agree with the mystics conceptually. You know, if you if we were to understand that if God cannot be seen, should not be seen as a concept, idea, or image, more so anthropomorphically, then yeah, we can only we can only experience the presence. And that's it. If you want to call that God, fine by me. But we can't go out and say, we can't go out and say, oh, guess what? God told me to bring you to, uh, to, to Egypt or to the promised land. Or God told me to you know, swallow gold fish. Or God told me to bring, to bring you to Waco, Texas, where everybody is going to be uh, brainwashed by, by, Jim, by, by this Waco guy. I don't know. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> now, if your definition of God is, is similar to the encountering of presence, then yeah, we're talking the same language. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know because of the limit of this, uh, the limit of the, the, the context of this, I would be very, be very much happy to continue with this conversation afterwards, if you like, uh, Joseph Martin, is it you? Was it you who asked me that question? Thank you, Dr. Guevara. Um, yeah. Time check, it's now 1017. Um, perhaps we can answer maybe like one or two more questions. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we Don't have worry, a it's, oh, it's okay. 1020 in the evening here, but I'm, because of you guys, I, I don't think I will be able to sleep until three o'clock in the morning. I'm, my mind is too excited. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, here, so we have a question from uh, Mr. Joshua Taiko. So okay. piggybacking on silence and dialogue, uh, how yeah. do you find the opportunity for dialogue on social media, Facebook, comment section, Twitter? In a sense, it, it is the most democratic and open space for conversation. But oftentimes here in the Philippines, you see conversations break down. So to simplify, do you think it is possible and should we work towards philosophizing in social media? <laughs> Good question. Um, I remember back in 2000 when Yahoo Groups was very popular. Um, I was very excited to um, share thoughts with uh, people who were uh, who 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 claimed uh, in, in the Yahoo Groups chat that they were interested in Levinas or or phenomenology or philosophy in general. And so yeah, so I was excited too. That was back in 2000 when I was first introduced to um, social media, uh, that kind of social media. And I was very disappointed that nobody wants to go, um, people were making, how'd I say it? They, they, they weren't serious. And up to, uh, up, up to, the, up to now, I, I still can't find somebody who is, or, or a group that is serious about uh, uh, one of my uh, challenging philosophers, I wouldn't say he's my favorite, uh, you know, Emmanuel Levinas. Um, I, I just, I guess maybe it's too early for me to give up, but I gave up. I just couldn't find any, any group that would. However, however, having said that, um, I think this conference has proven me wrong only because this conference has been um, uh, managed and arranged by, by philosophy students and, and philosophy professors. 
Uh, the only problem with that is that it's not there constantly like a Yahoo groups or, or Facebook. So my answer to your question is, I think social media is good if you, if you have, um, you know, people like uh, people from De La Salle University or Ateneo or UST or UP uh, coming up with this kind of conference or a social media. Yeah, that would be good. I think you should, yeah, that's what I think. I think social media has a, some positive aspect like we're doing it where, you know, we're using it right now. Thank you, Dr. Uh, one, other one, one other thing, but when it comes to social media, you can't be silent, right? So I don't think you'll ever experience, you'll ever encounter presence that way. Okay, okay. thank you, Dr. Guevara. Uh, for the other questions that may not be answered um, today, uh, is there a way, sir, for the audience or the attendees to contact you so that they can forward their questions to you personally? Well, <clears throat> via email, I guess, because I'm, you know, I'm an old guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't okay, use sir. Facebook. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, yeah, yeah, email's fine. I mean, that's fine. I, I, I don't mind. Or, um, Jim, you would you be open to, like, having an informal uh, get-together with the majors? That would be nice. One of these days, via Google Meet, maybe? I could arrange oh, something like that for you. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. It has oh. to be. It has to be my Friday. Is Your okay? Friday. Oh yes, of course. Which means yeah. our Saturday. Because by, by that time, you know, I can go back to sleep without having to wake up for work. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> yes, I'm, yes uh, Dr. Garcia, I'm this. Right. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Um, I know. Um, as you can see, you know, um, I, I miss you guys a lot. I miss LaSalle. Yeah. And I want to say, I want to take this opportunity right now, you guys. Um, this applies to just during my time and, and, and Lenny's time. Uh, at the time, La Salle to me was the only department that really embraced diversity, whether we like it or not. I mean, there was feminism, there was analytical philosophy, um, there was um, Nietzsche. And there were other ideas that I don't normally would think about, but because I listened to them, I said, yeah, huh, okay, there's something there, right? So I'm pretty sure everybody has their favorite philosophies, right? I'm very, very sure, or favorite way of thinking. But it's always good to, um, to be challenged and it's also good to be challenged and to, to embrace the challenge if you are already grounded in encountering presence, you know. All right. Okay, thank you, Dr. Guevara. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think we, do you think we have time for one more question? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so for the last question, okay, so here's a good one. Uh, since we're in the talks of terror, I would like to raise this. Uh, this is from Venus Clyde Manzanillo. Uh, what the previous question pertained to was the mind, but what if it is our external reality um, is what terrifies us. It is our environment that puts us in terror, hence numbing our capability to philosophize. Well, if you if you are you know in war, or if you are um, you know if you are being faced with impending impending well um, how do I say this if you are being if your life is being threatened uh, obviously there's no way you can philosophize I think you should run away or or be calm and and, and think of ways to solve problems um, so there are times when there. Are there's a there's an appropriate time to philosophize or better still there's appropriate time to you know be alone and and prepare the conditions by which you become silent and there are times when you know what you just put aside philosophy and do what you have to do yeah so i guess be practical I mean, if there's terror in reality, yeah, be practical. 
you should know how to uh, react to that. But there are times when you should not philosophize. There are times when you just have to act. I, I hope I, an I wasn't clear about that question, but I, I hope I answered that question, unless there's a, there's another one. Yes, I think you answered the question. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's one thing I'd like you to also understand, okay? Um, you know, when, when you get to the point when, you know, you, you've been so critical, not of other philosophies, but also about your own ideas, and you try your best to be very truthful to, <clears throat> to the facts of reality and, and, and not deny it, like, you know, Trump would, uh, who's a jerk. Um, you know, you try your best to be really authentic. You, you will find out that, you know, you, you would know that, you know, this, there's a time for to philosophize. There's time to, you know, to be practical. You know, you know what I'm saying? I guess. <clears throat> right. Okay. So thank you. Uh, to all of the attendees who asked questions, and thank you, Dr. Guevara, for your presentation and for your patience in answering all of the questions. Okay, so again, for um, those of you whose questions were um, not addressed today, so um, kindly contact Dr. Eleni Garcia so that she can um, so that she can uh, introduce you to Dr. Guevara, and that you can uh, talk to each other and ask your questions personally. All right. So uh, finally, for our closing remarks, so let us all welcome the DLSU Department of Philosophy Undergraduate Program Coordinator and our conference convener, Dr. Mark Anthony Becella. Hello. Hi, everyone. Can, can, you, can you hear me, Venice? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Hi. Uh... I'm uh, I'm so happy today, uh, seeing how this conference has uh, evolved. You know, when we started this five years ago, we were not even sure if we reach uh, twenty participants, and that already include uh, the speakers. Yeah. And then year after year, it gets uh, gets a bit more traction. We get a bit more attendees, and then participants, and and I, I'm just so happy with how it, uh, it seemed to have helped a lot of uh, students. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think uh, attending, presenting a paper in a conference can be uh, scary, yeah. but you, you have to experience it to, to get that, that kind of confidence that would allow you to, to, to present uh, in other conferences. So this is, this, is what, uh, this is one of the motivations why we organized this conference to give this opportunity to our undergraduate students to test their papers and to have that, that kind of experience you know, to, uh, for, for them to, to get feedback so that they can revise their papers if necessary. And then also to build that, that community. Yeah. Uh, I'm very thankful uh, for, uh, thankful to those who, uh, who help organize this event, especially uh, search, Dr. Fernie, uh, and of course, uh, Samahan ng Lasalyanong Pilosopo, headed by my students in research, uh, and uh, uh, especially Ridge. Ridge, can you show yourself, please? Ridge is our student, uh, lead student organizer. Uh, it's working very hard, and of course, our moderators who are uh, all alumni, the LSU uh, philosophy alumni. Uh, uh, thank you for volunteering to moderate. Thank you, Venice. I think Christian is here. I think Marco is here. Uh, and uh, Lorenzo Gutierrez, or Enzo, is also here. And of course, uh, the philosophy department uh, faculty, uh, headed by our chair, Dr. Boyles. And uh, our vice chair, Dr. Lenny. And of course, our uh, plenary speaker for today, Dr. Guevara. So thank you, everyone, for 
joining us in this conference and uh, to the speakers good luck and i hope that you you have you have fun uh, in today's event thank you Thank you, Dr. Idesela. Uh, before we end this, um, please uh, wait for Ridge to give his announcements first about the breakout sessions. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So first, we would like to thank you for your interest in participating in this year's fifth DLSU Undergraduate Philosophy Conference. So we are pleased to announce that 24 abstract proposals have been accepted for paper presentation for today. And uh, the accepted papers range from the following areas. So Eastern philosophy, Filipino philosophy, epistemology, philosophy of mind, feminist philosophy, postmodernism, moral and social political philosophy, and metaphysics. So we're going to proceed now to our breakout sessions or our parallel sessions. Uh, but first, we are inviting everyone to go through the guidelines that we have uh, sent out through email, particularly uh, the, uh, that the uh, the screen recording without the prior consent of the, uh, the the present the presenters is strictly prohibited, and that uh, the Q and A sessions would be similar to the plenary session. So questions could be raised either through the chat function or through the raise hand function. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have um, in our schedule, it says that, right, so we have a 15 minute break. So perhaps we can uh, take the break first and then come back later to our parallel session. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Guevara, are you still here? Yep, I'm here. Who's this? Uh, Mark 